Dr. Jeremy Weiss Dr. here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Pat Corpora, who's one of the legends of direct response marketing. Just to give a little background about Pat, Pat was president of Rodale Books and helped grow it from 35 million to 265 million. He went on to become Senior Vice President of Marketing at AOL and was responsible for all of their direct response marketing and managed a budget of almost $300 million. Pat became President of HCI Direct. He was responsible for transitioning a pantyhose business, which I'm definitely going to ask about, into a $125 million direct response company that served the women's market. Today, he offers his decades of direct marketing experience to us, but also to Healthy Directions, which is a doctor branded supplement company. And he assumed the role of interim CEO where he quickly established a new and successful strategic operating plan that generated double digit revenue. Pat, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, my pleasure, Jeremy, good morning. And you know, I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned with all these companies. And one thing I always ask about is a fun fact. And yours involves Saturday Night Live. Can you tell us about that? Right. So when I was at Rodale, one of our most successful uh, products that, that I think we'll probably uh, speak to was the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies. And uh, we took it from direct mail to print and finally television. And it was extremely successful in television to everybody's surprise. And uh, again, I think that was a good lesson learned. But what ended up happening, we were buying so much media that Saturday Night Live actually spoofed the Doctor's Book of Home Remedies with a skit. And they did the Dr. Kevorkian Book of Home Remedies. <laughs> and it's hilarious. And in fact, I just looked it up on YouTube because I hadn't seen it in a, you know, probably in 10 years. And uh, it, was, it was really a fun time. <laughs> so what did, they, what did they say in the video? Oh, like, so, like, oh, you know, our commercial, if you, you know, look that up, it would say, you know, calm a colicky baby, run the vacuum cleaner, you know, want to, you know, soothe an upset stomach, try chamomile tea. And he's, and, uh, you know, in that video, it was, it was like something, you know, want to, uh, 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 impact a friend, you know, throw the toaster in the bathtub while they're in there. <laughs> so, it was like, so it was all uh, remedies for death, of course, right? You got it. So, got it. That's great. That's great. Uh, well, not so great for that, but so. And when I asked in the in the, when I sent you the email ahead of time, and I asked, what do you get most excited about talking about? And you said fixing failing businesses. So anyone watching, even if they want to fix their business, that it's doing well, they want to get better, or it's not doing well, and you talked about how to identify a company's core assets and competencies to leverage them. Can you talk about some of the things when you went into Rodale and then HCI and Healthy Directions? Start with Rodale. What did you do to help increase the revenue and, I don't know, turn the company around, but just you know boost it? You know, when I was at, at, at Rodale, which was a, a great place to learn direct marketing, and I started on the magazine side, and I was working on Prevention Magazine, and the magazine business was the driver of the company. Uh, we had this book business, which, you know, had this checkered past. You know, one year would make a million dollars, the next year would lose a million dollars, and just never had really great direction. And, you know, I was uh, asked to, 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 to go over from magazines to books as the marketing director. And, uh, you know, and what we did was really we looked, you know, we, I always look at the customer database, of course, and, you know, who are the, you know, who, who's on the database, you know, what are their interests, and what then can we do to sort of like, you know, uh, provide them products that they need. So it was really a matter of product development. You know, it started with product development. They didn't have enough new books in the pipeline. And what we started was to look at the segments of the database and then research, which I think was critical because I think they did not have much research. And we, we actually researched the customers with concepts. We developed specific titles that scored high in, those, in that research. And then we went out and found uh, some of the best uh, copywriters and uh, talent to help us sell those books. And, you know, we, you know, uh, over a 10-year period, we took revenues from about 35 million to 265 million, and uh, very profitable uh, business also. Wow. Uh, wow. It was built. So we went in, we looked at the brands, we looked at the database, 
we looked at you know the, the internal resources and so it's a, you know I always think whenever I go into a situation it's uh, looking at like what are the assets and what are the competencies of the organization and can you leverage them and if if, if you know we'll talk about the pantyhose business but if a company has good bones you know good assets and good competencies your chance of success is so much greater yeah so with yeah. Rodale, so what did you see what did you see when you looked at the data and then what was one of the first couple uh, books that you created because of it well the uh, what we looked at was what was the type what were the type of titles that customers were gravitating to and they were really like in the supplements area mm -hmm. in the disease prevention area and in the, the natural remedies area those were the three big categories that I remember this was a this was a while back so uh, I had a terrific editor-in-chief a guy by the name of Bill Gottlieb and I asked Bill, I said, Bill, we need more titles in these three categories. And he and his team went out and they put together, you know, a half a dozen really strong concepts. And we took those concepts and we, uh, uh, you know, surveyed our, our audience to find out which of those were the best and then went on to develop those. So that was the core. So we went to the, like, these were the areas that customers were already buying, were buying books. How do we do it better? And then the second piece was to really look at the um, those segments and how can we uh, further define and segment titles. So, for example, in the remedies area, we then did a title called Home Remedies for Women, just women, and Home Remedies for Men. And we even did a Home Remedies for Pets, and they were all very successful. So. You know, it's, I wouldn't say it's not brain surgery, but it's like a methodical way of looking at your business and yeah. figuring yeah. out, like, what do your customers want? And then, again, how can you provide that, that information? Yeah. And a lot yeah. of people no. just think they know and they just, you know, create all the time, money, and energy into it. And it, you seem like you just asked your customer what they wanted and then went about to give it to them. Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, that was one of the biggest things when I went over into the book side was that uh, the editors just decided which books to publish. And um, when I said, well, why don't we like, you know, do some research and ask our customers, they initially felt threatened. You know, they thought, well, that's our job. Our job is to know what they want. And I said, well, maybe, but let's, let's figure out. And, and so they first resisted, but in the end, the editors were the biggest proponents of research. They wanted more and more research because it was gonna make them look good ultimately. And, you know, they, everybody wanted to publish successful titles, and uh, that was one way to do it, obviously. At least that was the start. It wasn't a guarantee that they were going to work, but, you know, you'd rather start with a, a title, a concept that scored 70% would buy versus one that scored 20% would buy, right? Yeah. How yeah. do you test that? Do you send them a survey and they just say, pick one, which one would you buy? Or what? what's the process look like? Well, typically, what we would do is, you know, we, we, you know, we, you know, back in uh, the late '80s and the '90s, it was all done through the mail. Now, you know, we can do it through email much more efficiently. So, you don't want to overwhelm the customer, but you may want to have like five or six concepts, and each concept probably has to have a good description of about a couple hundred words. It can't be too promotional, so it has to be pretty direct, because you know, so you're, you don't want to be selling too much. You want to present the facts. So you would send a, a survey to, to someone, um, and it could be someone who's bought recently, someone who hasn't bought in a year, someone who has never bought, and so you, you might segment all of those to get a reading of interest. And um, uh, you would ask them to read all five concepts, and at the end of each one, you, you, know, you, you would say, you know, this book may be available or this product may be available for... Twenty nine ninety nine, and if it was available, would you buy it or would you not buy it? And you force them to say yes or no. You know, and, and I don't like you know. Sometimes in research, they they give you a scale. Definitely would buy. Probably would buy. Maybe would buy. Maybe would not buy. I just like yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that seemed to work really well. So so then what you do is what 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 tends to happen is you. It, it, it separates the winners from the losers. So let's say you have six uh, titles, probably four, two are going to finish really low, two are going to finish in the middle, and two are going to finish towards the top. And then what I would do is take the two at the top, and I would go back to the editors, you know, and, and, and say, you know, these, 
which of these books excites you the most? Which of these books do you think you can do the best job with? And you know, you pick. Finally, I don't. You know, I don't really care. You know, you you decide which title you want to you want to produce. And so, we use that. We we were probably at the height of the business. We were probably doing thirty surveys a year easily across different categories. Wow! You know? Wow! Because you know, we had garden books, we had woodworking books. We had health books, of course, uh, and then subsets within all of this. This is fascinating this is, to me, Pat, because you know it's not like you were sending an email. You have to mail all this stuff out, and you have to get a response back. How do you get them to respond back? And this is expensive. This is expensive. You brought, it's expensive, but you know you're not mailing a lot. So you're mailing maybe five thousand, and we get very high response rates because you're going to your customers you, normally. And then we bribe them. We actually, it's a, it, it's so funny how it works. You put a dollar bill in the envelope hmm. and hmm. survey in a nice letter. So, well, it's a, it's a three-step process. The best process is a three-step process. You send an advanced postcard that says, you know, we really need your help. We're, you're going to be getting a survey in the mail. Please look for it and, and send it back. Then you send them the survey with a letter and a dollar bill, <laughs> which does work. And then you send a follow-up postcard to say, you know, you know, in case you haven't sent it back yet, please send the survey back. And we would get fifty to sixty percent response. You know, in a, in, in the direct marketing world, where three percent response, people jump up and down and throw celebration parties. You know, in the survey world, fifty percent is high. Now, in email, you, you can't send a dollar bill, and you live with much lower, uh, much lower response rates. But you can send out. Much higher quantities because of you know the cost uh, differential. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I figured if he, if you're getting the response via mail, then people can use this in their email campaigns much easier. Absolutely. So I mean, I think that research has to be part of any direct marketing business. Uh, again, you don't want research to drive everything, but it has to be an, an element of uh, any direct marketing. Yeah, and I want to. I will hit on some of your career points too, but um, because you were so excited to talk about how to fix a failing business, so that's one of the big things you did at Rodale. What's one big thing at HCI? And I, I have to find out how you got into the pantyhose business, also. So I was at AOL. I oh, AOL, from, yes. Well, no, I went from Rodale. I went from Rodale to to AOL, and uh, and so I was at AOL, and I was I was pretty happy with my with with my with my, uh, my my role there, but it was I was part of this huge company. It just merged with Time Warner, and uh, I got a call from uh, a recruiter, and he and he said, you know, we're looking for to hire a CEO job, and I thought that's pretty cool. And then he said, uh, it's a pure direct marketing business. And I said, well, that's perfect. That's what I do. And, and they said it's in the Philadelphia area, and I had just moved from the Bethlehem to. Uh, Virginia, and I, so Philadelphia is closer. And I thought, oh, that's good. I like Philadelphia. And then they said, uh, I said, those things are good. And they said, oh, by the way, they sell pantyhose. And I thought, oh, no, pantyhose. So, uh, so I listened, and I went. I did my due diligence. I went in to meet the, you know, the the owners, and I met some of the employees. And uh, it was this fairly large and in the past successful pantyhose continuity business. This very smart guy had figured out that you know women were wearing pantyhose and they wore out all the time and so he would send them a shipment every month. And so he had you know millions and millions of customers who had bought pantyhose from him through this continuity program. And so again it was like you know I went in and looked at the company and said okay the pantyhose business had gone from uh, these numbers aren't perfect, but they're close. I think from a five billion dollar annual industry to a two billion dollar industry in about a five year period. You know, women were just were not wearing pantyhose. The other thing that happened in the pantyhose market. This is probably more than you want to know. No, but, uh, this no. is the, actually the interesting <laughs> detailed stuff because this applies to any market. So, yeah. you know, so you know, so so Lycra was added to pantyhose, so they didn't wear out as often. So, do you know more than pantyhose than you want to know? Pantyhose. I said, do you know more than pantyhose than you want to know, or? I know more about pantyhose than you know, probably my wife does. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, so so the market was was shrinking. The business was had just gone into bankrupt, had just come out of bankruptcy when they called me, hmm. uh, right. and you know they needed a new CEO to sort of like figure out what to do, and it was owned by private equity guys. 
Um, so I went in, and, I, and what I found is that they had a, a huge database of, of women, all you know, 99% women, uh, who had bought the product. There was a lot of data on the database about these people. And then I interviewed, um, you know, the key employees, and they were very good direct marketers. You know, they were very good direct marketers. In fact, the guy who used to be the CEO came out of Reader's Digest, and you know, Reader's Digest is, you know, a good direct marketing company. So he brought a lot of skills. They were very good at regression analysis and segmentation. And then the third thing that I really liked is that. They were very good in the continuity business, which at Rodale, we were mostly a one-shot company. You'd sell one book at a time, similar to what a company like Boardroom Reports does. But this company was all continuity, and I'm a big believer in continuity marketing. And uh, so they were good at it. They had systems for it. They knew how to deal with the issues. And so those three things convinced me that we could sort of like redirect the company. So it was really a two-part plan. One was go in and stabilize the current business, the current pantyhose business. And, you know, we added new products. We added, like, shaper products, and we made enhancements to the actual continuity uh, marketing and customer service model, which was not very well done previously. And then we immediately started. I hired a couple of new people, and we immediately started research into new areas that these women would buy. And we see, we identified... Uh, a number of categories that there was high interest in and we sort of took it all the way down and then we eventually launched two very successful new products and you know got the company growing again and we were able to sell it for the for the private equity owners so it was a great experience it sounds like the it's common not, theme not, too is you're asking you're them what they're wanting and they're helping you do the research what was something that surprised you with the feedback that you got that allowed you to come out with a new product or go in a specific direction um, Does anything you know, surprise I you? I don't think there was. Well, you know, I guess the thing that that, that it surprised me, but it also didn't surprise me. Of all the things that we we tried, that we tested, and we surveyed early on, was that they were interested in health. Even though these these women really had no propensity in general for health, they hadn't bought a health product. They bought a pantyhose product. They were all interested in their personal health. So the three categories that scored at the top were uh, weight loss as a category, uh, vitamins as a category, and anti-aging as a category. So those were so the first thing was just broad categories of interest. Those were the three. So I thought that surprised me a little bit. You know, it wasn't kitchenware or it wasn't shoes or something. You know, it was it was it was health related, and I felt good about that because. My background from prevention and from Rodale was health, so I felt I could really play in this area. So then what we did is we took those categories down to the product level. What would be the anti-aging product? What would be the vitamin mm -hmm. product? What would be the weight loss uh, products? So, uh, yeah, I think that customer feedback, that back and forth is just critical, and you know, it's got to be part of any direct marketing company. So what were some of the products? Because you have pantyhose, and then you're, how do you link that to anti-aging or, or something like that? Completely separated them. I don't think we didn't link them, but, you know, we, uh, so what we did is, so, so the first product is, you know, so, so anti-aging, so we looked at those three products, and, and we, and, uh, th these three categories, first of all, and the first category, weight loss, what we found is that to do it as a continuity uh, may not be the strongest, because people you know, uh, jump around from, from weight loss product to weight loss product. So the idea of being able to ship something on a regular basis may not, you know, have a lot of, of life. Uh, weight and vitamins, although I've changed my mind now since I've been working at Healthy Directions, uh, people thought of vitamins a little bit as, as a commodity, and we couldn't really figure out, like, well, what would be the angle that would make this unique? You know, you can go into Walmart and there's, like, aisles of vitamins. So uh, skincare was the most interesting, and what we found was that women were very interested in new skincare uh, products. So we went much deeper, and we said, so, okay, if we do, if there's something in anti-aging skincare, what should it have? And so they wanted a, 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 first of all, they wanted a general moisturizer. They didn't want like a multi-step thing. They wanted something with SPF. They wanted... Uh, you know, I forget the details, but, you know, we sort of then put together all those elements and we went out and found like, you know, uh, 
a manufacturer and we went through clinical trials and we launched something called uh, Enrich, you know, Silky's Enrich. And, uh, you know, we turned it into about a $25 million product pretty quickly. Wow. wow. That's amazing. How extensive is, it sounds like clinical trials would take a long time and be very expensive. It was, it was, you know, that whole, uh, you know, the clinicals on that were probably one hundred and twenty-five, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, is my guess, and I think we, uh, it was probably was a six-month process. So we were, we were doing things, you know, simultaneously. I had a group of people working on the new business, you know, the skincare or weight loss or something else, and then I had, you know, the core team working on how to improve the the, the pantyhose business. And you know, I think that one of the biggest things we did there was. We really improve the continuity uh, mechanism, and you know, my whole thing was put the customer in charge of continuity. You know, because but what would happen before is people just got shipped product every four weeks or every eight weeks, and it was really hard for them to control. And so we just made it much easier for the customer to be in charge of their shipments. And so you know, our cancellation rates went down, our retention rates went up, our satisfaction went up. So the the process of the new product development like took over was it like almost two years before we were in market with something mm-hmm. uh, because of clinical trials and research and product development and packaging and everything. But um, you know we had the core business that kept you know that we kept improving the core business as these new businesses were coming along. And then once we had the first new product, we had like you know a whole like wave of new products behind. And not a wave, but we had several new products in the wings because we were working on multiple. Yeah. And Pat, as you say that, it seems completely obvious, but I would think when you go into a company like that, do you get pushback because you're telling them now we need to spend more money to produce whole new products? Did you get any pushback with your what you were doing? No, I think at, um, I think at, at uh, HCI Direct, they knew, they saw the writing was on the wall. I think the investors and the employees all knew that you know, this company had been losing sales for like five or six or seven consecutive years. Mm -hmm. Profits were down and they knew something needed. They they couldn't keep doing the same thing. I think the thing that did surprise them a little bit was that we were actually able to stabilize and even grow the pantyhose business while we were adding new products. I mean, like, so you can fix a, a, a bad business if you sort of pay attention to the details of it. And that's what we did in that, in, in that particular case. And then, you know, um, you know, there were just a lot of things that we could do from the marketing standpoint, the customer service standpoint, the operations standpoint, from the product standpoint to, to, to you know, to, to, to you know, uh, create greater satisfaction. Yeah. So yeah. going on to healthy directions, because now, I mean, you've built up this huge reservoir of just knowledge and information in the health industry. What do you do with Healthy Directions? What kind of state was it in when you came in? Well, I mean, I so after uh, we sold um, HCI Direct, uh, I decided I just really wanted to work for myself. I wanted the flexibility of, of being able to work for myself. Uh, and then secondly, I really wanted, you know, just like to have more variety in my day-to-day work. And so you know, so I've been, uh, you know, consulting uh, for the last seven years, and I've worked with all types of companies, uh, nonprofit companies, international companies, public companies, private companies, all over. And in that time, I've, you know, been in, uh, been asked to join several boards. And one of the boards that I was at, I did an assignment for Healthy Directions. I looked at their acquisition business, like, I don't know, four or five years ago, maybe. And then I, they asked me if I would join their board of directors, which I did. And so uh, they, I, I not the supplement industry has been growing, but the healthy directions business had been in decline for you know I think some real good reasons. Uh, their CFO and their CEO uh, last March both left the company, and the owners, who are private equity guys, asked me if I would step in as the interim CEO. So I basically put everything else aside, and I moved to Maryland, and uh, for the next eight months, basically ran the company on a day-to-day basis. Hmm. And again, it was it was, uh, and it, so I, so I was doing doing two things. One was, all right, what do I need to do to get this business back on track? And then secondly, how do I build a team that can go on without me? And, you know, because uh, I didn't have any intention of, you know, having that job full time or living in Maryland for full time. So that's what, so since March 2012, 
that's what I've been doing. I uh, hired a new CEO at the end of 2012. So, you know, it took like you know, about eight months to I, what I thought to get the business back on track. And then, in, you know, in, in January of 2013, uh, I became the executive chairman of the board. Um, and so I'm sort of managing as the executive chairman. And the company, it's not a secret, it's public knowledge. The company is, is currently on the market and, you know, uh, that, you know, we probably, you know, in the next several months that, you know, there, there may be a transaction for uh, healthy directions. So why, when so, you, like you said, the supplement or vitamin industry is going up and they were going down, why was that? So I think, again, it's like they weren't really paying attention to what their core strengths, what their core assets were, and uh, how the, the customers on their file wanted to buy. So um, uh, the fellow who came in was a very smart direct marketer, uh, but he came out of the catalog business. And so the way that Healthy Directions had, had been successful in the past was by um, doing Magalog promotions, you know, single shot Magalog promotions, well written copy by some of these great copywriters. They were used to work with all the great copywriters. They would produce these 20 to 30 page promotions about this powerful supplement and customers would read this and say, I just have to have a supplement or I can't go on another day. And they would order. And so uh, the, the, the the previous CEO and even the CEO before him, who and he didn't last very long either, unfortunately. Uh, that was before my time, though. Uh, they wanted to move the business more to a catalog model. Like, why why send out a 20-page promotion selling one vitamin when you can send a 28-page promotion promoting 50 vitamins? And so they changed that strategy, and it just bombed. It just completely bombed. The response rates went way down. The customer purchases, you know, decreased, and customers were, were confused. And so one of the things that I did, again, it was not a big idea. I took them back to what they had done. The other thing that they did is they walked away from all those great writers. And so my first six months was, you know, getting on the phone and nurturing those writers back into the fold and saying, you know, we really, I'm sorry that we alienated you. We really want you back and, you know, we need you to work for us. And I think we're now working with like, you know, all the top writers again. So, you know, uh, it took eight months to really, you know, get that business back on track. It was mm -hmm. promotion driven. Uh, you know, fortunately, again, uh, similar to HCI Direct, there were people on staff who were great direct marketers. You know, they just were able to, uh, you know, sort of execute, you know, what I asked them to do. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it you know, was working. Last year, 2013 was the first year that uh, the company had revenue growth in at least five years, I think. Wow. I wow. mean, eight months <laughs> seems like a short period of time considering the period of time that wasn't doing well. Um, what are some of the best-selling products and uh, that you found that they, you know, that when you send out these long maglogs that you really need to focus on, you know, what, I guess, what they want? What did you focus on or what did you have them focus on? Well, I mean, I always leave that to the right. So what we do is we do a very good creative brief, of course, and we say here's all the benefits of the product. The other thing about healthy dressings is to take a step back that, you know, at, at HCI Direct, we decided we didn't want to be in the vitamin business because we thought it was a commodity. At, at Healthy Directions, they solve that problem. So what they have done, they've gone out and found expert doctors, and they build the vitamins around these doctor brands. So there's three major doctors there. Uh, the, the number one doctor is a cardiologist, um, uh, Dr. Steven Sinatra. And so he has a whole line of vitamins. There's Dr. David Williams has a line of vitamins, and Dr. Julian Whitaker has a line of vitamins, and they all have sort of their niches. So uh, what we do is we create a, 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 a brief for the writer, and uh, we say, okay, this is Dr. Sinatra. Here's his expertise. This is his supplement. This is why it's unique. This, this formula is not available anywhere else, and it isn't. These are unique formulas that he has developed. Um, now, they can be knocked off by somebody, but you know it's unique to him. And so um, with those details, I think the writers then are able to really like put together compelling information using the doctor's voice. And if you look at any of our promotion materials, the doctor is very highly uh, promoted and uh, reinforced and his credibility. 
And then I think the other thing about healthy directions, which, you know, uh, again, you talk about what are the good bones of a company, they're just sticklers for quality. You know, they're manufacturing qualities. They're, it's, the only, it's the only vitamin company that triple tests every single supplement uh, bottle. So they test the raw ingredients, they test the, uh, the supplement as it's being manufactured, and then they test the supplement after it comes out of manufacturing. I don't think another supplement company does that. So. So we talk about all those things, and then so those that's the credibility of the product. It always has to start with with great product, of course, and then the uh, the other thing is like you know strong offers, you know strong messaging, and you know uh, you know if it's new, it's powerful. If we have you know if we could surround it with free gifts, with unconditional guarantees, you know all those things really add up, and so. You know, you put all of that in in a copywriter's toolkit, and you know, if you hire the right writers, you end up with like some pretty big successes. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to hear about some of the successful campaigns and why they were effective, and some of the ones that didn't work and why. But I I want to hit on because I was reading through some of the notes, and what I asked about what are some of your favorite headlines, and you mentioned um, things that stick, you know, you know, that stuck in my mind, which is what you just said. Which is free and new. new. What would we talk about that for a second? Your your question is what have been some of your most successful headlines? And I said, I, you know, my response was, well, I, I leave that to the writers. I mean, that's what we pay them for, and it's amazing. Uh, like for example, one of the the top headlines we have right now in our top product at Healthy, Healthy Directions, it's called uh, uh, "Take Two and Call Me in the Morning," or no, "Take Two and Call Me When You're a Hundred. And so it means like take this supplement and like, you know, and live forever, right? So it was, it was a very clever headline. It, it, it increased risk. Everything else in the package is identical except for the cover of this Magalog with that different headline. It increased response by 30 or 40 percent. That's it's huge, 30, 40 percent, right? Wow. So I leave that to the writers, of course. But I'm a big believer that, you know, as a consumer, you know, two of the words that you in direct marketing that you can't use enough are new and free. You know, people love free stuff. So we always give away uh, a free extra bottle of vitamin C. We give away a free report on, you know, how to lose weight or manage, you know, you know manage your heart. So I'm, a, you know, so I always feel like, you know, if you can say, if you can add new and free as you're doing, as you're as you're in your selling mode, whether it's email or direct mail or you know uh, display advertising or print, it's going to boost response a little bit. Now, those will not replace really strong copy. In the end, it's the copy and the promise of the product, and then the product, of course, has to deliver. But you never, if you can use free and new, do it. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, stuck in my mind when I when I read that. Um, so, what are some of the most successful campaigns that stick out in your mind, and why were they so effective? So, I would say you know the um, probably the most successful one goes back to where we started our conversation with the doctor's book of home remedies. And so, I, I you know so I, I moved from magazines to books. And one of the first things I, I start doing is immersing myself in what's going on in the business and, uh, and what has sold and what hasn't sold. And I found that there's this book called Natural Home Remedies that has sold 100,000 copies a year for five years in a row. And, you know, it, you know it's almost just on its own. And so, I, so we looked at that book, and, I, and, and that book was a compilation. The number one... Um, uh, column in Prevention Magazine were, uh, was a, a column called Mailbags, which were readers' letters, which were all home remedies. And so a really smart editor at Rodale had taken years and years and years of all these reader remedies and had turned it into a book called Natural Home Remedies. And so it was all these readers, like I cured my acne by putting this on my face or something. And uh, it was really popular. And so so I said, you know, this book is like 10 years old, Bill. Like, can't, like let's do a new one. And, and, and his response was, well, you know, we really can't because re people just don't write to the magazine as much as they did, used to. You know, years ago, everybody wrote and we would get thousands of letters a week or, you know, and, and so you have, but now we don't get as many letters. So he said, let me think about it. He came back about a week later and said, all right, we can't do a reader's book of home remedies. 
What about a doctor's book? What if we interview a thousand doctors and we get their home remedies? And I said, oh, Bill, like, that'll never work. And he said, you know, our customers, like, you know, they don't like doctors. They want to stay away from doctors. And so, of course, you know, so uh, he said, no, you know, I think there's something here. And so we, we surveyed it. It scored number one. It was like the number one. It was called the doctor's book of home remedies. I owned it, by I the way. Well, you know, there's 13 million copies in print, so there's a good chance you own it. So, uh it scored number one in the survey, and then Bill went off with his team, and they actually they interviewed you know that thousand doctors, and you know put together this powerful book. So then we went out to like I think we, we took three copywriters who were really strong, and uh, and again it shows that you you know you have to spend money to make money. Two of the two of the the, the writers had got an average response. It would have been a nice successful book. One writer, this guy Jim Pumphrey, who's a terrific copywriter, his his package, and I don't remember the headline now because it was so long ago, it uh, almost doubled response. So wow. we rolled out on his package. It was a huge success. You know, the book did extremely well, and then we decided that we were going to take it into other um, other media channels, and uh, uh, and TV was the one that really took off. And no one was doing direct response books on TV. I think we were about the first to do it. And, um, and, and, and you know, I think the thing that really made it work is um, we said, we want to send you this book uh, uh, for a free trial. You don't have to give us your credit card today. We believe this book is so good. It's going to change your life. You know, just call and we will send it to you for a free 21-day trial. And then if you like it, uh, you can pay for it. If you don't like it, you can return it to us. And, uh, you know, uh, we sold, I think, Three million copies of that book in probably about a year and a half that we were on the air. Wow. It was pretty wow. amazing. That's probably the most successful promotion that I've been involved in. But you know, product launch and then promotion launch on on a single product overall. Is that a portion that of the a, sales a, pr- funnel, or is that was that the was it one product, or was there anything else like after some about the product that you offered them? But that was just on the single product. I mean, there wasn't. It wasn't like you know today when you call and there's like you know you, you get a dozen upsells on the back end. Right. Right. Uh, that was just a single product. But then, of course, you know, we took those names and we created ancillary products for those people. But, you know, that was all done on that single, you know, that single title yeah. overall. Yeah. Any other, Any other ones that stick out in your mind out. of successful campaigns? One other that was, um, so, so again, this, is, this goes back to, to, to the book world. And uh, it's... Um, we created a new series of titles, you know, but Rodell was mostly a one shot uh, business. And we thought, you know, we really should try and be in the continuity business. And at that time, Time Life was the 800 pound gorilla in continuity with all their, their book series. So we created something called the Prevention System for Total Health, uh, which was, I think, a 15 book series. And I remember uh, when I came over from magazines to books, um, you know, most of the promotion. Uh, packages were fairly, you know, routine and unique, and you know, sm- they were small. You know, there was nothing ex- exaggerate, uh, you know, unique about them. So I remember we we went to a writer who was doing some work for uh, Time Time Inc. and you know for Time Life, and it was a fellow by the name of Alan Friedenthal. And I remember we gave Alan the assignment. Said Alan, we have this new series. We want you to write a package for us. So he came back and uh, with two things that we had never done before. One that you know, I don't think anyone had ever done before in the industry, and the other one was something that Rhoda had never done. He wanted us to use a nine by twelve envelope instead of a six by nine or a number ten. And you know, people said, "Oh my God, that'll be so expensive." You know, how are we going to do that? And, and I said, "Well, Alan, why are you, why are you recommending a nine by twelve? He said, "He said uh, time life uses nothing by nine by." except nine by 12 envelopes. And I think they know something. And I, and he was absolutely right. So, so then he, so that was like, okay. But the thing that was extremely clever that he, he, he made, he made this up. You know, that's why, again, you go to the, to the most creative people in the world. He took the merch, a mer- he, he, he took a merchandise return label, which is, you know, to send, you know, today you can go online you, and, you know, if you want to return something, you print a label and you stick it on. That didn't exist. So Alan created a merchandise return label, and he wanted us to affix it on the outside, the back of the outside of the envelope. And it said, so you couldn't miss it. It wasn't inside. It said, 
we think this series, I remember the headline, we think this series is our crowning achievement. We're so sure that we're giving you the return label now so you can send this, these, this book back if you don't agree. And what it did, it completely disarmed the customer. The customer said, these people are like, they're giving me the, the return label right now. I don't have to like, you know, like free is really free. I don't have to give them money in advance. I can preview the book. And if I don't like the book, I don't even have to worry about paying the return postage. I just put the label on the box and send it back. And so when people internally saw that, they thought, oh, my God, this, is, this will be a disaster. It's going to like, it, you know, like, you know, people are just going to, everybody's going to return. Yeah, bankrupt the company or something. Yeah. So what happened was, so, it, so again, the nine, so we test, so the, the great thing about direct marketing is you can test all these elements separately. So we tested um, the smaller envelope against the bigger envelope. And then we tested the bigger envelope with the return label and without the return label. And what we found is the bigger envelope, you know, beat the small one, you know, like time life knew something. And then the second was the return label double response and returns didn't change at all. It didn't impact returns at all because, you know, you sent the, the return label with a promotion. The book came a week later at the time, you know, they kept it for another three weeks. That return label was probably long gone unless the people were really careful and they saved it somewhere. They had, they lost that weeks ago. And, and the book was was a great book. I mean, the the product was great. And now, if it would have been a bad product, maybe yes. we would have gotten yeah. hurt. So, so that was an amazing promotion. And that that you know, putting the return label, you know, using the return label as a way to uh, remove resistance to order became actually a standard in the industry. You know, uh, we used it. I know Reader's Digest copied us and used it. Uh, you know, Boardroom Reports used it. A lot of, you know, everybody was using it. So that, that was a huge pro uh, success. And again, you know, uh, great copywriters, great creative people make all the difference. That's a great That's story, a Pat. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so what about one that didn't work and why? Uh, you know, there was... There was a promotion that was around for a while where that I copied uh, from someone else. You know, one of the things that I also, you know, let me take a, a, an aside. There's a, a very good direct marketer out of Philadelphia who's also a copywriter, uh, Denny Hatch. And one of his, the things that Denny talks about is stealing smart. Like, you know, if you, you need to be engaged in the business, you need to, be, you need to see what's going on. And you need to then steal smart, which he means is adapt what other people are doing for your business. You know, like, and you know, so if it's working for someone, you know, adapt it. Don't just take it. So one of the things that was happening that I saw that was happening is people were mailing live checks to customers, you know, like a $2 check or a $3 check or a $5 check. And when they endorsed it, there was language that they were actually signing up to receive something, to receive a book. And I thought, this is really clever. So we worked with our finance department and we actually produced all these live checks and we mailed them out to customers. And uh, lo and behold, you know, all these people, like, you know, they, they weren't returning a mess. So they would sign the check, they deposit it, the bank would route that information back to us and then we would send them the product that was you know listed on the check well people you know were very confused you know they thought like you know why am I getting this product you know it, it was a disaster as you can imagine people like thought oh I have this five dollar check I'm gonna deposit it uh, two weeks later a book shows up in the mail they have no idea they have no connection because they hadn't read any promotion literature they didn't make a positive choice so that was really bad. That one was, I really had to back pedal very, very quickly from that one. And that was a mistake. And I probably knew better that I shouldn't have tried that uh, because it was a little deceptive. Uh, but, it, but it was a good lesson. It was a good lesson to be upfront and clear you know, with the customer because uh, if you try and deceive a customer, it's ultimately going to, uh, uh, you know, come back. And so we never repeated that mistake again. Yeah, that's a good yeah, one too. Any other uh, ones that didn't do well? <laughs> Excuse me. You know, the other ones that did not do well, I would say were product related. You know, the product, like, you know, for example, at, at Healthy at, uh, HCI Direct, one of the products that was in our pipeline was a sleep product. What we found is that, you know, 
people want to sleep, you know, and, and sleep is a problem. And so we did some research. We found a product that we thought would work. I forget what exactly what the ingredients were. Uh, but I think we all knew the product was didn't really, well, you know, it wasn't Ambien. It wasn't Lanesta. It was an herbal product of some kind. And, you know, the product just didn't work. And so, I mean, I thought the lesson there, and, and, and I've seen it in other places, is, you know, if you have a product that you don't, you're not passionate about and you wouldn't take yourself, then you shouldn't try and sell it to others. So I think that that's the other place where I would say, you know, I've like, I've, you know, you know, had some, some failures, obviously. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you, you know, obviously the research probably showed that was a good product to go into and you probably did produce a decent product. Why do you think it still didn't work? Well, I think it was, you know, so yeah, the research showed it was a good category to go into. And then I think we just tried to come up with the best, I don't think we came up with a, a product that really worked in the end. I think that, you know, we, we talked to, to scientists and to manufacturers and they said, you know, you combine this and this and this. And in the end, it just wasn't, it, you know, it, 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 it didn't like put people to sleep and keep people asleep. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that's what it was. It just didn't, it just didn't work. And I think it's a hard category. I think that, you know, if it was, uh, if there were products, natural products that weren't like uh, prescription related that worked, I think it, w it would be a great category. I think sleep is still a great category. Yeah. yeah. Now, what about, you know, obviously you've had a successful career. What were some big roadblocks or challenges you ran up against? Uh, you know, the big, one of the big things that really, uh, took a lot of time and, you know, I, I found very frustrating when I came to HCI direct, uh, they were involved in a number of legal issues around their continuity program, you know, and as I, you know, their continuity program wasn't as transparent as it should have been. And so I inherited a class action suit in oh from California, oh state of California, and you know, that was bad enough and a 17 state attorney general investigation. And so I've spent, it took me three years to resolve both, both of those. And, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, and we had to resolve them in order to sort of get the company sort of moving in the right direction and put that behind us. And, but I found that to be very frustrating, very time consuming, very expensive in the end because we basically settled with uh, both the AGs and with uh, the state of California. Uh, and again, my, you know, so my, you know, my advice is, uh, you know, in business, well, it doesn't matter what business you're in, you know, you have to be squeaky clean, you know, yeah. you have to play yeah. by the rules and you cannot, you know, take advantage of uh, consumers. Um, you know, eventually it's going to catch up to you either by, you know, lawyers who are looking out for um, behavior like that or from, you know, uh, state attorney generals or from consumers themselves. You know, I, I'm sure what I'm sure that what happened was that consumers got fed up and they started uh, complaining and those complaints escalated. And, you know, once there were enough of them, it just sort of turned into a snowball. So I found that, you know, to be probably one of the most frustrating things because, it really wasn't completely in my control. I think when, you know, you have a business challenge, you work your way through it, you, you know, you try different things, you can resolve it, you can put things aside, um, you know, but when you're dealing with sort of legal issues, it really changes things. And, um, you know, I would say, you know, another thing that, uh, what, what I did once, which I think was a mistake, and, you know, I think it's, you know, the idea of not compromising, when I was at Rodale, um, the owner, uh, who was a, you know, this wonderful woman, uh, Artie Rodale, she was really into spirituality and, you know, and she really wanted us to do a line of books around spirituality. And, and I think we, we knew it was going to be hard to do, but we launched uh, a new imprint around spirituality books and it just, it, they didn't work. You know, we just couldn't sell them. You know, people just were not that passionate about, you know, spending a lot of money for these titles. And so I think, you know, the, so I think the lesson there is that we probably should not, we should have, you know, firmly but politely said no to the owner of the company. But then I would say to our credit, we realized, you know, we put together the data and we said, look, this isn't working. This is the projections into the future and, you know, we need to stop. And so we, you know, we were able to pull the plug pretty quickly. Yeah. So and, yeah, and, go ahead. As an aside from <laughs> direct response marketing, I had a question about something. Um, um, how do you manage the stress? 
Because it's hard enough to run a business and then you have all these lawsuits pour, you know, coming in. How do you personally manage stress? Well, you know, personally, I, I, uh, I think I'm a big proponent of exercise, I, uh, especially aerobic exercise. So I'm an avid cyclist. I you know, used to be a, an even more avid runner, but I still do run. And so I try and get like an hour to two hours of aerobic exercise every day. And, wow. and I honestly think the best time to do it is the middle of the day. I mean, if, when I don't, if I don't exercise in the middle of the day, uh, I actually, my afternoon is not as productive. You know, it just sort of clears my head. And, and I do some of my best thinking on a bicycle or, you know, when I'm on, on, you know, out running on the roads. And so I'm a big proponent of exercise. It keeps your head clear. It keeps your body, you know, strong. And uh, I'd recommend it to anybody, even if it's a brisk walk. Yeah. So, yeah. Pat, what's been, yeah, what's um, been a low point for you? And then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment for you? Uh, you know, I would say that, you know, I spent 20 years at Rodale, which was like the best company I've ever worked for. And I would still, you know, uh, say that even although I'm working for myself and enjoy that tremendously. But, you know, after 20 years, they, uh, it was a family owned company and still is. They hired a new CEO, and that CEO came in with the idea that he wanted his own executive team. And I was at the time was the president of the book group. I had a counterpart who was the president of the magazine group, and you know both of us were asked to leave. And wow. uh, you wow. should say that you know after 20 years at one place where you really you know you love the environment, you love the people, you love the product, you thought you had done so well. Uh, you know, leaving it in a position like that was 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 somewhat hard. I would say overall, uh, it's like getting a divorce like, almost. At the, yeah, I said, you know, it was like it was a big deal. It was like, oh wow, this is really like, what am I going to do now? And now, having said that, I would say that uh, since Rodale, I've been actually much more successful because you know I got to work at a public company at AOL, although it didn't turn out as great as I would have liked it to. HCI was an amazing uh, business. I became a CEO, was able to like launch new products and sell a company. Uh, you know, being at Healthy Directions and being involved in that activity has been terrific. So, you know, if I had stayed at Rodale, I may have just gotten you know, you know, fat and lazy and comfortable. Who knows? Right, right. What about a proud about- moment in your career? Uh, you know, I think some of the early successes in direct marketing over on the book side was, you know, it's probably some of the things I still think about the most is that, you know, no one expected that book group to do much. And, uh, you know, what happened quarter after quarter and year after year, you know, it just kept growing and growing and growing. And, you know, it's it became, you know, the largest and most profitable uh, division in the organization. It really allowed the company to launch a whole lot of new products, and you know, it was really nicely successful. I, was, I think that that's still probably like you know the high point of it. And and one that I think I think about direct marketing is the people who do best in direct marketing are the people who are both right and left brain thinkers. You can't be one or the other. So if you're just a creative person, you have all these wacky ideas. I mean, that's good, but you need to then execute them. Um, and if you, but on the other hand, if you're purely analytical, you're going to miss the big ideas. And I think what I found is the people who are the best direct marketers are the people who can use both sides of their brains. They're the people who like, they follow the numbers, but they're not slaves to the numbers. And I think that's like an important message overall. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. have a wealth of knowledge. Who are some of your mentors? Who gives no, you advice? Who gives you advice? I think, you know, I was really fortunate at Rodale. I think I worked for two really terrific people. One was the president of the company called uh, Bob Tufel. He's in the Direct Marketing Hall of Fame and uh, is a you know, terrific guy. And uh, I would say one thing that Bob said, he, he, he thought that, you know, uh, that we should always work with, like, the best talent in the industry. Uh, and he, I remember he once told me, we were talking about testing. Testing is very expensive, as you can imagine. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, you could spend $100,000 on a test and it fails and it's gone. You know, there's, you got nothing for it. <laughs> so but Bob said, I remember, I, I will never forget, and I use this all the time. He said, the most expensive test is the one that you don't do. And he said, you know, if you try and save money by not testing, your business is going gonna, is gonna to go down. And, and, you know, so you might do four tests and three fail, but that one winning test is going to pay for all of them. And that's what moves the business forward. And, and the other, so, so he, you know, he was terrific. 
than the guy who hired me into direct marketing out of, I started as an accountant at Rodale and uh, a, a, a fellow by the name of John Griffin. And, you know, John was just, uh, you know, a very dynamic, uh, you know, person who really trusted people, gave them probably more responsibility than they deserved. And I think when you put people in that situation, they tend to rise. And I think that, you know, he got the most out of, out of people. So those two people, I think, were, we're really good mentors, and then along the way, that we've had, we, you know, I've, had, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of terrific consultants. You know, there was a guy who I worked with for years, uh, Gordon Grossman, who came out of Reader's Digest, and uh, and I remember one of the things Gordon always said, it's not about CPM, which is cost per thousand, it's about CPO, cost per order, which means you can spend as much money as you want as long as the cost per order is good enough so it's so if somebody might look you know like when I go back to that 9 by 12 envelope and say oh my god you know 9 by 12 it's so expensive it's going to cost instead of 30 cents in the mail it's going to cost 50 cents in the mail and uh, but you know if you can get a 5% response instead of a 2% response it more than pays for itself so i think you know i've had good advice over the years with all with people like that yeah yeah. Pat, I know we're about out of time, so I have one last question for you. But tell people where they can find out more about you, what's exciting lately for you. Well, I think, you know, right now what I've been really working on is um, healthy directions. I think that my time is going to wind down there in the next several months. Um, and, you know, so probably all I'll do is take a break because it's been a pretty intense uh, year and a half to two years there. And then I probably want to like you know look for another company that I can help fix. Uh, overall, I have a couple of other consulting projects that I'm in the middle of right now. Uh, but what I found through Healthy Directions that I really enjoy, uh, you know, being the on the ground operating person uh, for a limited time. You know, I you know it's not I don't want to be a CEO for for the, of, a, of a company for the next four or five years. But I like to go in and work with good people. Uh, or put good people in place and sort of move a business forward. So my last so question my last is, is, Pat, Pat I want to hear wanna about, about the origination of where uh, you started with the fig tree. You have a, a serious persistence. I suggest everyone watch the video on YouTube about the fig tree. Where, is that, where did the origination come from? You mentioned a little bit before we get started, but I wanted to hear where, it, where the stem of it is. We're an immigrant family. You know, we immigrated from Sicily in the 60s, and uh, we moved into a Sicilian uh, neighborhood. And uh, everyone had, you know, they uh, what immigrants do is they try and like sort of mimic their 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 their, their lives in the new world. And you know, uh, there were no fig trees in Pennsylvania, so uh, my parent, my father, and you know his friends and my uncles. They all had got fig cuttings. They smuggled them on the airplanes, and you know, and uh, uh, and they had, um, you know, they had fig trees. And what they found is that in the winter time they would die in Pennsylvania because of the harsh winter. So uh, it's a pretty elaborate process that you know, if you want to keep a fig tree alive, you have to work really hard at like protecting it in the winter. So there's a big process where you tie this tree together and. You wrap it with carpeting and you put plastic around it and, you know, you keep it warm through, through the winter. And, and people try all different things like, you know, taking it out of the ground and bringing it in-house, but that disrupts the roots and then you don't get, you know, good, good thick production. So, you know, it's one of the things I've been doing for, uh, you know, I probably helped my dad uh, wrap fig trees when I was six or seven years old. And, you know, I sort of at age 58, I continue to do it myself. I love that story. Love that story. And watching you... You know, just wrap you know, the carpet wrap the and carpet. like it just it seemed like the the yeah. hardest workout I've ever seen <laughs> when I saw that. In fact, one of the things that, that, that's happened in the neighborhood here is I've actually given cuttings to other people. So now what I do is I go around every fall and I help each each person wrap their fig trees. That's turned into this. Even thing. worse for you. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot more work. Pat, I yeah. really appreciate your time. This has been super valuable. Yeah. I was anyone reach out, thank Pat, and um, you know, just thank you so much, Pat. I appreciate it. Pleasure, Jeremy. It was uh, great chatting with you. Thank you. Bye.